Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Jay Marshall here, Senior Systems Engineer in VMware's Cloud Application Platform Group. And welcome to Build Your First Mobile Application in the Cloud in 45 Minutes. This is actually an abbreviated version of a session I did at VMworld 2012 this year, both in San Francisco and Barcelona. And based on some feedback, thought we'd cut it down to a video and throw it out there for anybody just starting to dip their toes into the mobile pool. Uh, it's kind of a fun session, so kick back, grab some popcorn. Hopefully, you'll maybe learn a couple of things and build your first mobile app in the, in the meantime. Uh, if you're coming from the vFabric blog, we actually have a link to a download of a PDF guide. It's a complete do-it-yourself guide, step-by-step, uh, 50-some -step, pages. Uh, complete with screenshots. So we'll be moving pretty quick here today. Uh, so if it goes too fast, obviously the guide, you can follow at your own pace. Uh, but hopefully we'll have some fun. So stay tuned. Here we go. So in terms of what we're going to accomplish today, we're actually going to be building two applications. Uh, kind of what's illustrated on your left-hand side of the screen right now is uh, kind of your standard database-backed web application uh, that we're used to building. So web servers, app servers, database servers, uh, kind of the typical... Um, cast of characters there. And then we're going to go ahead and bolt on a REST service to that application to expose uh, some JavaScript object notation or JSON. And then finally, of course, we'll build our mobile app uh, using some mobile web technologies, so some uh, JavaScript frameworks. So that's it. We're going to jam all that out here hopefully in a half hour. So like I said, grab some popcorn and hopefully we'll have some fun. Uh, also thought it might be important to talk about what the video is not um, because Gartner recently re released a report that I think showed over a hundred different tools and frameworks now for doing mobile development. And it's a very fragmented field. So I thought maybe we can just be very specific about the goal of this video. Uh, it's not some sort of formal introduction to enterprise mobile uh, uh, development strategies or anything like that. This is meant to have fun. Uh, it's not a full stack boot camp. Uh, you know, we're going to show you a selection of technologies that you could use, but you can pick and choose which ones you want to use or not. I mentioned Mobile Rockstar. You might not even be like local bar band quality by the time I'm done with you today. Uh, it's not a formal class on any specific development technology. We're going to be using our very own Cloud Foundry, Spring Source Tool Suite, Grails, uh, but we're not going to be doing any kind of technical deep dives. You know, obviously between uh, YouTube and Google and plenty of places to buy books or uh, our own consulting training services, uh, plenty of places to go deep. Uh, once again, it's just going to be an overview. Uh, not only is this not a best practices view, I may be showing you some worst practices. Um, once again, the goal here is just to have some fun. And of course, it's no substitute for taking a proper uh, mobile development course. Uh, in terms of the tools we're going to be using today, as I mentioned before, we'll be using Cloud Foundry, a true platform as a service. We're going to show you how to get signed up and start deploying apps right away. And we'll be using the Spring Source Tool Suite. Uh, for those who are familiar with Eclipse, this is our implementation of Eclipse. Uh, it has some great features built in, like a, a, our own servlet runner with TC Server, our implementation of Tomcat. Uh, but we're also going to use it to build our mobile app. So we're going to get all this done today using these tools. So for those may, maybe not as familiar with Cloud Foundry, uh, it is a true platform as a service and an open one at that. It's an open source project. Uh, you mentioned when we say choice of clouds, choice of frameworks, and choice of services. Uh, for public, private, and micro at the top, uh, you can run your applications, for example, on our own hosted cloudfoundry.com. You can go to cloudfoundry.org and download the bits yourself if you want to run it in your own data center, a la private. And we even have something we call micro cloud foundry, which you can download, uh, also known as cloud on a stick. And you can run the entire platform uh, right off your laptop uh, or desktop computer. With frameworks, obviously, we're known uh, for Java via the Spring framework. But we also have support for Scala, Ruby, Node.js, you know, others being added all the time. And from a services perspective, uh, we're not just talking about databases like Postgres or MySQL, but also messaging services as well as NoSQL data stores like Redis and MongoDB. So all of this is actually baked into the platform so that you as the developer don't have to worry about all of the middleware on down uh, components that we traditionally have to work with or work with our infrastructure teams on. Uh, it just kind of comes out of the box. It makes the whole software development life cycle a lot easier. So you're going to get introduced to this today, hopefully. Uh, sign up for your own account and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I think that uh, maybe someplace I'd like to start is just where the actual websites themselves to download and sign up for these tools. So if you just go to springsource.org, along the top of the screen around the middle, you can see Get Started. 
If you click on that link and then go down about the middle to the right a little bit, you'll see Get Toolkit. Uh, essentially, just click on that link, uh, pick the distribution for your operating system, step through the wizard, and you have Spring Source Tool Suite installed on your machine. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, it's what we're going to be using for everything here today. So that's the short and sweet on uh, STS, Spring Source Tool Suite. And then Cloud Foundry by simply going to cloudfoundry.com. Once again, about the middle of the top of the page, you'll see get an account. Very simply, the next page, your email address. Go ahead and type in your email. Scroll down, click the terms and conditions, enter in the CAPTCHA, and hit request invite. You will get an email with your login credentials, and you are set up for Cloud Foundry. Uh, once again, that simple kind of illustrates the power of a true platform as a service or PaaS that it doesn't really take that much work to get set up. So that's it. Once again, the do-it-yourself guide will give you even more screenshots and step-by-step, -step, but that's really what we're talking about here. So if I jump over to my Spring Source tool suite that I already launched here, this is kind of the welcome page. You can see up here the tab says welcome with a little X next to it. If we kind of close that out, this takes you to the default perspective. Uh, for those not as familiar with Eclipse, a perspective is nothing more than a collection of views. And each view is just uh, responsible for certain aspects of how you're viewing your workspace. So Package, package Explorer is more or less kind of a directory tree-ish. Uh, down here we have our servers, our console. So it's just a collection of views for us to do our work. And where we kind of want to start at is by adding a server or connect our Spring Source Tool Suite workspace or STS workspace to Cloud Foundry. So if I right click down here under servers, we can see we get a default TC server or Tomcat instance out of the box. If I simply right click and say new server, we'll see that I, under the VMware category, I have Cloud Foundry and I can pick next. And all I simply have to do is put in the email address that I signed up for my Cloud Foundry account with. And I'll give you a little tip here. Uh, one thing that I always do to try to uh, make things easier, I always click on validate account. Now, in this situation, uh, we can see I was lucky enough to put in my valid information. But I have been known to fat finger my password. And when you do that, um, it just makes troubleshooting a little more difficult as opposed to just clicking a button. So just a little tip, tip from Jay there. But anyway, if you double click your Cloud Foundry instance now, this will bring up the Cloud Foundry editor. And if we click on the Applications tab, we'll see a list of all applications that we've deployed so far. So we're actually now looking inside of my Cloud Foundry account, and, or your Cloud Foundry account, of course. And when I click on an application, I have the ability to boost the memory or to actually increase or decrease the number of instances. So if I'm having performance issues or something of that sort. Uh, but what we're gonna do first is down here under services, actually add a database. So right now here's my VMworld database. Let's go ahead and add another one. So I will call this my blog database, and that will also be a MySQL database. Just to note, here's all the other services we were talking about currently supported by Cloud Foundry. But we'll go with MySQL and hit finish. And that's it. We are done in Cloud Foundry for now. It created the database for us. It is a MySQL data store, and it will be available for us. So think about what that would take to do in a traditional environment to get a database up and running. So pretty cool stuff. So that's it, our STS workspace, wired to Cloud Foundry, we can communicate, we set up a data store. So let's go ahead and create that database back web application we were talking about. If I right click under Package Explorer, say new, I can pick a Grails project. I will call this my web application and say finish. It's gonna ask me if I wanna cut over to the Grails perspective, I'll go ahead and say yes. And once again, a perspective, if you look up here in the right hand corner, we were in the spring perspective. But this is actually going to give us a unique view of the world as per a Grails app. So if I expand my web application, we'll see that the way it's kind of broken down the structure here, uh, both with icons and with the kind of the categorization of my, uh, my artifacts, is very conducive to building a Grails application. So I have my domain, my controllers, my views. So what we want to do first here is create a domain class. If I right click, go under Grails tools and say create a domain class. And domain class is really kind of what we would traditionally call a model class. 
So it's just going to be the fields and the definition of the data that we're going to be storing in our database. And it will actually create those database tables and everything for us on deploy. So I thought we could create an application that we're going to call challenges or we'll create a domain called challenges. And the purpose of the application, we're just going to store and have people tell us uh, what their biggest IT challenges are nowadays. So in the last three years, we've seen mobile and big data and social, and these things kind of dominate IT. And those all came out just in the last three years. So we're going to see what people's biggest IT challenges are. And we can see that STS generated a kind of a shell of a class for us. And this is in Groovy, so it has a very Java-like syntax. You can actually even use Java. But we'll go ahead and just use a little bit of uh, Groovy syntax here and say string first name, string last name, string big challenge. And that's why I want everybody to enter. I want to know their first name, their last name, and what their big challenge, biggest challenge has been. I'll go ahead and get rid of some of this stuff. What I'm doing in here now inside this constraints section what I'm doing here is adding my validations. So, you know, whereas in Java years ago, maybe you'd have to do, you know, check for nulls and, and trim and check lengths. You know, in gro Groovy here, I can just very simply say blank false. And that's essentially uh, my validation to make sure people are putting data uh, into the object. So that's it. That is my challenges domain class. All I have to do now is right click on domain, go down to Grails tools, run command wizard, and if I say generate all, I'll go find my challenges class here. There it is, and say finish. And Grails is now going to go and generate a complete working CRUD application for me. Uh, all the screens, uh, the controller class, which just came up here, everything is gonna get built for me. Now, I've worked with case tools maybe 15, 20 years ago, and that sometimes gets very scary. But um, it's actually just generating the code that you kind of should be writing anyway. So it's really a great way to do prototypes or even just kind of a first cut of your application. So what we can see here is a challenges controller that came up. And you can think of a controller as essentially kind of a traffic cop for your application. We can see uh, index for uh, when it first uh, launches, list, create, save. So pretty much a request comes in, the controller is going to service it. And we'll actually be adding our REST service in here as well. So we just need to make a couple changes. If we come over to our configuration folder here and go to build config, we now simply need to tell this application that we're talking to a MySQL data store. So under dependencies here a little ways down, Grails is actually smart enough uh, to know that you know, I might very well be talking to a MySQL data store. So it actually gives us the code. It's just commented out. So we simply back over the con comment and we now have our MySQL dependency ready to go. We also want to go into our actual data source. The data source, as you would expect, uh, tells the application where to go get data. So up here, we're just going to kind of replace our class with the MySQL driver. And we're going to get rid of the username and password because we don't need that. Uh, this is another feature of Cloud Foundry. When I deploy my application, I'm going to tell that application uh, which data source to bind to, and it takes care of it automatically. So we'll come down here, get rid of development and test. And in case I didn't make this clear enough, remember, Grails built all this for me. I didn't have to write any of this code. So I'm going to go inside here. And for my JDBC URL, I'm simply going to go ahead and say MySQL. I'll make it localhost DB. And that's it. I am now configured. This application knows to look for that MySQL data store that I'm going to have in Cloud Foundry. We'll see that when we deploy at runtime. And we'll be good to go. We also have a views section here. If I expand that, it generated a challenges folder. Here's my form.gsp. A GSP is a groovy server page. So much like JSPs with our custom tags has a very HTML-like syntax. So we can see our first name here, our last name, and our big challenge. But what we want to do here is we want to replace big challenge with an actual dropdown. So I'll just go ahead and grab that big challenge line of code drop in some drop down code. We can see we're going to let our users pick from big data, cloud, mobile, social. I just like saying polyglot. So we'll save that off and our screen is done. So lastly, we talked about bolting on a REST service. So we're going to go ahead and define that REST service as mobile feed. And this is how easy it is to create a REST service inside uh, of Grails. So let's go ahead and say render. 
Let's go ahead and grab our challenges ob object. And we're going to say list, which will just very simply return a list of all data that's in the database. And we're going to say as JSON. And we'll just go ahead and use the default Grails JSON converter. And that's it. That is our REST service. So at this point, we have now built this entire database-backed web application. We're going to simply now get ready to deploy to Cloud Foundry. This is kind of fun. We're going to grab the My Web Application project, and we're going to drag it and drop it right onto Cloud Foundry and let go. And that's going to pop up a wizard. And this asks us for a name of the application. So let's just go ahead and call it Challenges. It knows it's a Grails application. It knows it needs a Java runtime. If I hit Next, it automatically prepends my application name onto cloudfoundry.com, and that is where this application will run. We'll go ahead and leave the 512 meg default for memory, tell it to start it on deployment, and when I hit Next, this is where I have my choice of services. So if I select my blog database, this is where it will bind the application and all that stuff I configured from a data source uh, perspective to that database on Cloud Foundry. So I will now say finish, and we will now start to deploy. So while it's doing this, what I want you to think about is in a traditional environment, what would it take to spin up uh, the actual servers or the virtual machines, uh, install all the middleware, even if you have scripts and whatnot to do it, configure all the individual components so that everything knows how to talk to each other, uh, get this application deployed and released, and then even go through the process potentially of doing DNS updates or what have you, so that somebody goes to you know, challenges.yourdomain.com, it actually will bring that application up. We literally just did that here inside of 10 minutes. So right now, STS is building the war file essentially via Grails, connecting to Cloud Foundry, uploading everything it needs, and deploying the application. We can see here start, server startup in a little over 7,000 milliseconds. So if we now bounce over to a browser and go to challenges.cloudfoundry.com, we can see our default application come up. Now keep in mind, this is just kind of the out of the box Grails uh, stuff that comes up. If I hit challenges controller, you can obviously modify this, add your own style sheets, what have you. But check out some of the cool stuff Grails did. So it took my field names uh, that were camel case and actually turned them into labels uh, naturally. If I come here and say new challenges, and I just hit create. There's my validations that I put in. Here's my drop down that I had entered. So let me just go ahead and put some data in here. I'll go ahead and say Jay Marshall. We'll go ahead and say mobile is my biggest challenge. I can get my nice challenges one created. Let's go ahead and create a couple more. So if I say John Doe, we'll say has this cloud. I'll go ahead and create one for Jane Doe. We'll say hers is big data so on and so forth. If I click challenges list, I can get my nice list of data. I can go back into any of these. I, and I get a view screen. I have to hit edit to update. So I mean, it's a fully functional CRUD application. Now, if I go back to my challenges list and now in my URL at the end, if I simply replace list, which was my method name and change that to mobile feed, which was my JSON rest service. If I hit enter, I will actually see the JavaScript object notation coming out of my application. So there you go. You know, at the end of the day, in probably 10 minutes or less here, uh, we built a complete working web application from scratch. Now, in terms of, if I bounce back over here, in terms of why I wanted to go through that process, um, there was multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, I see a lot of folks in my travels that uh, you know, maybe their first generation mobile apps were very marketing driven or they outsourced uh, all of the activities. And now I'm seeing a lot of folks that are truly trying to consider their mobile application as a strategic weapon. You know, they're building competitive differentiation through these mobile applications by touching their customers uh, in this new kind of new world order, if you will, of uh, mobile apps. And so even though you might not build a Grails application from scratch, what I want you to see now is we're going to build a mobile application also using Cloud Foundry, also using the Spring Source Tool Suite, also doing all the same stuff, but we're simply going to consume that JSON REST data. 
So whereas we just got done building a browser-based app deployed to Cloud Foundry, we're now going to be building a mobile app also deployed to Cloud Foundry. Now, you'll notice the little box there with a compass in it. That's something called WebKit. That is an open source browser engine. And these JavaScript frameworks that you may hear of, they're kind of based around WebKit, meaning that your Sencha Touch, Dojo Mobile, jQuery Mobile, they're designed in such a way that when these different devices render your applications, so your iPhones, your iPads, your Androids, you're guaranteeing a consistent look and feel across all of the devices. And that is what is critical. It's not about a UI anymore. It's about a UX. It's the user experience. Okay, we're not building games in the enterprise anymore. So a user has a certain expectation for how lists work and how lists kind of float. And when you touch or you swipe, it's a behavior that they're used to. So it's not just making a button big on the screen or making text big on a screen. So these guys have all gone through a lot of work to create these great frameworks to give you a native look and feel on a mobile device through these web technologies. So we're going to end up using Sencha Touch 2 uh, for the rest of this example. That's uh, kind of a personal fave of mine, but you, know, you can pick whichever one you want. So let's go ahead and bounce back and get started. So if we go over to the Spring Source Tool Suite once again, I'm just going to go ahead and close out uh, this whole window and kind of collapse my Project Explorer. So I'm kind of starting from a clean slate once again. Uh, so we can see that we're going to build a brand new project and everything from the ground up. But this is the other reason that I wanted to build that Grails app first. Because once again, that reusing of technologies, we're going to see how similar this all is and also see how to talk to REST services since we now know what those database fields are and everything else that we're looking to talk to. So let's go ahead in the white area over here and we can click anywhere we want. Right click, say new. And we're going to say dynamic web project. And just like before, this time we're just going to say my mobile project. It already says Cloud Foundry for the runtime, so we'll just say finish. And it is going to go ahead and create my entire folder structure for me once again like it did last time. So let's just start by adding just a regular old uh, index.html page. We'll just go to new other, come down to web, and pick HTML. And we'll just call it index.html since that's usually in the welcome list of most app servers. Now for title, let's go ahead and call it challenges. That's the name of our application, right? So we're just going to go with challenges. We'll just go ahead and say, hello, Cloud Foundry. And that's it. Let's get that published. So we're going to drag my mobile project, drop it right on top of Cloud Foundry. And when we let go, we're going to get our wizard again. So let's just call this uh, mobile blog. It knows it's a Java web app. Once again, Java runtime. If I hit next, we're going to prepend once again, mobileblog.cloudfoundry.com. We'll keep the 512. Now, when I hit next this time, I do not want to pick any services, right? Because I want to talk to the REST service that my other application is exposing to me. So I'm just going to say finish. It's that simple. So when this actually deploys, once again, much like last time, we're essentially provisioning a brand new uh, application space on Cloud Foundry and punching this out. So the server started up in about 193 milliseconds. Let's go ahead and bring up another window. And we'll just go to mobileblog.cloudfoundry.com. And there we are. We can see the title of our HTML page. Challenges came up. Hello, Cloud Foundry. So once again, in literally 30 seconds or less, we pumped out, uh, although it's just an HTML page, a brand new application right out the Cloud Foundry. So we have our structure. We have our web content. We have index.html. How do we now turn this into kind of a formal uh, mobile application, something that looks, smells, and tastes like a mobile app. So this is where we're going to start wiring in these JavaScript frameworks. So I mentioned about using Sencha Touch 2. You can go to Sencha.com, download the frameworks. Once again, it's in the do-it-yourself guide, but uh, it's, it's very easily available on Sencha.com. But if I jump over here, uh, let's see, into my, I have these resources already set up. So here is sentiatouch-all.js and sentiatouch.css. If I simply drag those into my web content and say copy, all right, I'm just putting those right in a root once again just for simplicity's sake. And these are just two of the files uh, that are inside the, uh, the distribution, but it's really all we need. So now all we have to do is make sure our HTML page 
has references to uh, the CSS and style sheets, or I'm sorry, CSS and JavaScript frameworks. So we'll just go ahead and inside the head tag and put the links inside. So this is very simply linking to the Sencha Touch style sheet, which is of course gonna help with uh, a lot of the visuals. And then also a link to the JavaScript, Sencha Touch All, which is gonna help with the animations and other things that we have. So the other thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna kind of copy that script and also put in app.js. Now what is app.js? And I'll actually get rid of Hello Cloud Foundry while I'm at it since we don't need that. App.js is actually going to be a link to our JavaScript file. You know, these, these are Sencha resources. We need to, a canvas where we're going to write our application code. So if I right click on web content, say new and file, and we'll just create app.js. And this is it. This is our canvas that we're going to use to build our mobile application. So if I come back to index.html, we'll just go ahead and save that and we're done here. Everything that we need for this index is finished. When a request comes in, it's gonna come over here, pull up the index.html file, has all the references we need and talk to my app.js. So we'll close that out. So here we are. Now, when I said earlier on about not being a deep dive in specific technologies, uh, this is pretty much the Cadillac example of what I was talking about. <laughs> Uh, JavaScript uh, can turn into some very unwieldy code very quickly. And uh, Sencha, as a JavaScript framework, uh, even kind of has their own uh, way of, of kind of doing coding and nesting. So I'm going to kind of start off a little bit slow, show you how to build a, a basic kind of Hello World app. And then we'll kind of bolt on the extra pieces from there. And, you know, one last time, because it's probably getting annoying, uh, the do-it-yourself guide, uh, of course, breaks it down in an even slower fashion. So to kind of start off with, um, I'm just going to kind of type the whole line here, uh, ext dot application, left paren, right paren, semicolon. So in pretty much you know, the two basic concepts of Sencha that I would share that it helped me out was, you know, getting used to Sencha objects. So, you know, ext is kind of the, the home base for all things Sencha. And in this case, you know, this is the application function, right? And pretty much what you're always doing is you're passing uh, a list of, of configuration parameters into various functions and various calls. So that's where the nesting starts to happen. So for example, uh, the name of my application, I'm just gonna call it once again, my mobile application. And it doesn't have to match. So in fact, I'll just say, um, you know, JavaScript, just to make sure there's no confusion. It doesn't really matter what you call it. I'll put a comma because I want to have another configuration parameter, and that one's going to be launch. And my configuration parameter for launch is actually going to be a function with configuration parameters. All right. So once again, when you look here, things like name and launch, that's kind of the second part of this, which is the actual configuration parameter names. So as I mentioned before, there's books, there's great YouTube videos, lots of places to go and dig deep on the actual code. But uh, we'll just kind of continue here and build out what we're doing. So the first thing I want to do in my application here is just have a panel on the phone. I start with the basics, right? So we're going to say ext. Once again, there's kind of our home base, if I spelled ext correctly. <laughs> and we're going to say dot .create. And as I did before, left paren, right paren, semicolon. And now I'll just step right back into my parentheses. And once again, this helps me keep the, the code kind of a little bit cleaner and I don't worry about losing track of my parentheses and what have you. So I want to create an ext.panel, which is once again just the panel on my screen. I'm going to put a comma and another curly brace for some more configuration parameters. And notice when I click enter, STS keeps everything very well formatted for me. So once again, kind of another nice feature. So it's going to say full screen, uh, true, comma. And I can actually put just regular old HTML code in here. So we'll just say hello, Cloud Foundry Mobile. And that's it. That is my first mobile application. Now that's not all we're doing, so don't get cranky here. But if I expand my Cloud Foundry uh, server down here in the lower left-hand corner, right-click on my mobile project and say update and restart, it'll actually republish this. So this is something a little bit new as you're going through your mobile efforts. 
Uh, simply recoding and republishing your app is very, very simple. I'll bounce, I'll bounce over here. In the rest of the session, we're going to use the iOS simulator. So if I hit Safari, come up to my browser window here and say mobileblog.cloudfoundry.com. And we will see challenges at the top. And hello, Cloud Foundry Mobile. So we can see we have our kind of Sentra framework all wired up and delivering content for us. So let's go ahead and get a little bit deeper here. Let's create a, a list now. So instead of just simply a panel, we wanna go ahead and actually change that to list. We want a list to show up on the, on the page. We can leave it full screen true. Uh, we have another configuration parameter called item TPL. It's a, kind of a template, if you will. If I get rid of this, and instead let's talk first name and put a comma, and let's give it some data. So we're gonna kind of give it a list of data. If I come down here, each one of my uh, data elements, I also have to put inside of uh, curly braces. So I'm gonna go ahead and say first name, and we'll just say, uh, we'll go ahead with J, why not? Comma. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna kind of create a, a simple list very quickly. So we can kind of illustrate some of the, the native looking and feeling uh, elements that we have here. We'll put Shannon in here, replace all. And then all I'm really gonna do here is kind of mix them up a little bit just so that it's a little bit easier on the eyes to, to kind of see what's going on to really illustrate the, the list, if you will. And we'll just go ahead and grab that whole thing. We'll do it like two or three more times just to really show a, a nice long list. So that's it. We went ahead and made that change. Let's go ahead and republish. And hopefully you're also seeing how easy it is inside of Cloud Foundry to do all of this uh, and SDS. That was the other reason for doing the Grails app was to kind of show uh, maybe a different way to do some regular app development, right? So if I go to my iOS simulator, hit refresh, and now we can see a list of data. And if I scroll, notice how it scrolls and kind of does that floating behavior where it slows down as it starts getting close to the end. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about from a UX perspective, or I'm sorry, UX perspective. This is what folks are expecting. So when you actually click an item, you know, notice once again how the bar turns blue. It's a little bit of a darker blue on the bottom, a lighter gradient on the top. This is what folks are expecting and where I think the, the JavaScript frameworks really excel. Uh, so great, great stuff there. But this isn't really what we came here to do, right? Uh, we created this wonderful web application. We wanna see that data now in our mobile device. So let's go ahead and go back here and change this application to actually show the data that we entered in our first app. So if I come inside my function and I'll drop this down, I'll put a comment that says uh, create our list. And the first thing I wanna do is actually add a model object. So much like we had the domain object in Grails and I kind of referenced it being a model, we need to explain to our JavaScript app now what our model looks like, what the data looks like that we're gonna be referencing um, in the application. So that's what our model code is gonna do for us. If we take a look at this, you can see ext.define, and we're going to be defining a challenge uh, object. It extends ext.data.model, so once again, you're seeing these EXTs everywhere. And it has its own configuration parameters, and they are fields. And here is our first name, last name, and big challenge once again. So, you know, when we did the Grails app, you should be very familiar, obviously, with what these are. And this shows you how to define a model object inside of Sentia that we will then reuse in our list. So now we need to tell the application how to go get data to plug into the application in conjunction with the model. So now we need to go and actually add that store code, which looks like this. So once again, ext.create ext.data store and it says use the challenge object and then we have a whole bunch of proxy information here in terms of how to go get the information so the type of pro uh, proxy is a json p proxy so javascript object notation with padding in terms of the url that it's looking for if i come back over to my grails app from before and when we had our json data i can very simply copy that url and we'll go ahead and drop that inside here. That's where it's gonna go and get the data correct. 
But we also have this thing called callback key. Now, you know, I go into this a little bit deeper inside the do-it-yourself guide. Uh, this is part of the deep dive stuff I talked about. Um, it has to do with same origin policy with JavaScript. It's a security feature not allowing JavaScript to make calls uh, to places other than where it originated from. So Accenture provides this callback key to kind of allow us to have a little bit of a workaround. Because if you think about it, the application, the challenges app, is running at challenges.cloudfoundry.com. The mobile application is running at mobileblog.cloudfoundry.com. So even though they're the same domain, uh, the subdomains are different. So uh, that same origin policy still applies. So let's go ahead and say callback key. Let's call it the mobile key. And now we're going to have to tell our Grails app to look for that mobile key. So let's go ahead and bounce back over to our Grails perspective. And we'll open up our web application, go under controllers, if you remember the traffic cop, open up challenges controller. And now for mobile feed, we just need to add a separate piece of code here. So I'm gonna leave them both in place, but we can see it's gonna to go to the HTML parameters and look for the mobile key. That's what we're passing in, right? But then the rest of this is pretty much exactly what we were already returning before. So it's just parameterizing it and putting them together along with a pair of parentheses you can see right here. So this actually allows Sentia to know that it's okay to actually use this service. So we'll go ahead and come down to the web application, right click and update and restart it. So it will republish that REST service. I really wanted to go through that exercise so you could kind of see uh, the simple version and then also how we can make it talk to our mobile app. So let's go ahead and close out our challenges controller. Go back over to our spring perspective. And that's getting pretty close to it except for one little detail, right? We now need to tell our list to use that store. So we don't need any of this data anymore because that's the whole purpose of what we're doing here, right? So we'll get rid of that data. And now instead, we're going to say store. How about the challenge store? And what's the challenge store? Well, let's just go ahead and put a variable in front of this. Call it the challenge store. And we should be good to go. So we have our model object our store, which uses our model object, consuming the REST service we created before with a little bit of magic sauce here. And now our list is going to go ahead and use that challenge store. In fact, let's go ahead and put the last name on there because we know we have that in our model. So we should be good to go now. Let's go ahead and update and restart the mobile application. If I bounce back over to the Grails app and refresh that screen, you can see now it starts off with null because we're not really checking the key, but that's actually the, the mobile key we're passing it. And we can also see those parentheses that I was talking about. So the REST service has been republished successfully. We'll go ahead and get rid of that. And now we can see our mobile app republished. So if we go back over to iOS and hit refresh, we will see that here's the data that we entered inside of Grails. So once again, Jay, John, and Jane. Kind of funny, I didn't mean to do that, but anyway. So we may go ahead and enter in some extra data here while we're continuing the application, but you can see once again, we're getting real data out of that REST service. Pretty cool stuff. So let's go ahead and add some extra functionality in here. We're gonna go back to our code and under create our list, we're gonna add a property called grouped true. All right, let's go ahead and start grouping uh, these lists so that alphabetically and what have you, uh, they start showing up together. So we're also gonna go ahead and need to add a little bit of code to our store. So it's actually knows what to sort and group by. So we're gonna go ahead and sort by last name. We're gonna have a grouper config param using this group function. That's also gonna do some cool stuff for us. So hopefully what you're starting to see here once again Whereas this might look a little bit more complex. Imagine if you'd have looked at this at the very beginning. But we've really built this out piece by piece. And once again, although there's a lot of nesting going on here, hopefully it's uh, relatively easy to follow. So let's go ahead and save this and run this. We're going to save. We're going to right click again. Say update and restart. And what we're going to do again, you know, is STS, bundling up, packaging up to Cloud Foundry, and pushing live to the web. And when I drop over to my mobile app and hit refresh, I can now see 
a whole bunch of new data in here. Johnny Blastoff, honey boo boo. Um, and when I scroll now, once again, I'm getting all of my data in order. I'm getting some of the nice group function uh, type stuff that you're used to seeing. Uh, pretty neat stuff, right? So let's keep on going. Let's go ahead and add one last little piece here to really make it look and feel and smell like a mobile app. If we simply come down after our list and we'll go ahead and throw a couple extra returns in here. And what we basically want to do now is add kind of an event listener of sorts that's going to go ahead and when someone actually touches an event, so we have an item tap, it's going to do an EXT message alert, so a pop-up message, taking the data, big challenge, and displaying it on our phone. So when we say challenge list here, what is challenge list? Well, let's go ahead once again and create a variable, assign it to the list that we have, and that's all we should need. We right click and say update and restart here one more time. We should see our app start doing something pretty cool. One last publish out to Cloud Foundry. Here's our screen changing for us. Hopefully we'll get server restart. If we wait patiently, that is. There we go. And if we bounce back over to the mobile application and hit refresh. Now when our list comes up, we can actually touch the individual line items and we'll actually see what their biggest challenge is. So in this case, mine's mobile. If we go up to John Doe, his was cloud. Jane Doe, hers was big data, so on and so forth. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, once again, it kind of looks, smells, and tastes like a real mobile application. We'll do one last little cool piece here. If I go back over to my folders and grab this little icon, this is the Spring Source Tool Suite logo. I'm gonna go ahead and drag that into web content and copy that in. So it's once again just in the root. If I go to the top and add to my list of uh, configuration parameters, I'm going to add one called icon and just reference that icon.png. Put a comma on the end here. And I will do one last refresh. And what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of take it that last little step uh, to give it kind of that native mobile look and feel. So one last server restart. There we go. One last refresh. When the application comes up, we'll make sure we didn't break anything. There we go. Johnny Blastoff says, what problems? So now if we go ahead and just hit our button in the bottom of the screen, in the middle, say add to home screen, we can see it grabbed that icon.png. It took the challenges title out of our HTML document. And when I say add, it has now added and if you will, installed, quote unquote, the challenges application to my home screen on my mobile device. If I hit it now, when it loads the application, notice it is now a completely Chromeless browser. It is running as if it were a true native looking application. So there you go, I can hit the buttons. Gary Coburn's biggest challenge is cloud, so to speak, and our application is now running. Now. This is build your first mobile application in the cloud. I think we're probably a little bit over, uh, maybe even 45 minutes now. But uh, this is it. This is pretty much everything from the mobile app through the uh, database-backed web application. What I want to kind of end with here, you know, for folks, I'm sure some folks are out there saying that, you know, this isn't really a mobile application, right? Uh, this is a web application that looks like a mobile application that's running in the browser on my phone. And you would be correct, okay, since it is build your first mobile application. If this was build your second mobile application, or if we decided to take maybe 90 minutes instead of 30 to 45, uh, I would introduce you to uh, PhoneGap or Apache Cordova now as it is uh, from an open source perspective. What PhoneGap allows you to do is take those HTML, CSS, and JavaScript resources that we built and it actually packages them into binaries, or the binaries, I should say, that you publish out to the various uh, app stores. So what happens is when a user actually goes and downloads that application off of, say, the app store of Apple's, um, those binaries include the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they are actually executing native locally on the phone. So whereas right now, yes, it is a browser and it has to go back to the server to get resources. In this world, that is not the case. 
It's executing locally just like a native app would, and it's just consuming the REST services like a native app would. The other nice thing that PhoneGap and other frameworks bring to the table, you can see here access native device features. Uh, so the simple example is the phone, or the phone, the uh, camera. So you can get simple access to take pictures within your JavaScript via your mobile app and things like PhoneGap Build for helping do builds for you automatically. So once again, as I said initially, this was meant to be fun. Hopefully write yourself a little mobile app to kind of show your friends and have some fun with. Uh, but if you do want to take this to that next step, don't think of this as being just simply a browser uh, app that looks like a mobile app. You can do some great things with it. So I think I went a little bit over, but uh, in, uh, in the nutshell, that's uh, build your first mobile application in the cloud in 45 minutes. I do appreciate your time, especially since I said before, I think we went over a couple minutes. Uh, but hopefully you have some fun with this stuff, guys. It's a, a fun, fun place to be right now, and hopefully gave you something to think about. Thanks for tuning in.